Right, good morning, everybody, and welcome to this week's show. Um, as usual, I will take you through news from Investment Trust Land, um, and then after that, Richard Williams is going to introduce or interview this week's special guest, Andrew Jones from London Metric Property. As usual, if you've got any questions, please email them in, or better still, stick them in the Q&A box. Um, but first of all, I wanted to talk about Hickel Infrastructure. This is a fairly simple piece of news. Um, it has sold its investments in the Bradford Schools PPP scheme. Um, now, it's had these sort of quite a while. Uh, it's sort of interestingly, there was phase one and phase two to these projects. Um, they're sort of PFI projects. It's acquired its phase one investment, I think, in the secondary market in June 14 um, and phase two um, in June 2009. But it actually topped these up in 2021. Now, say so it's just sold both of these for a sort of combined purchase price in the region of £37 million. Pounds. But I think the sort of interesting thing here is that actually over the period that it's held these, it's actually made some pretty decent money when you consider that you know, these are effectively or sort of backed by government revenue users or sort of these quasi-backed. So you know, for its phase one investment, which is obviously it's held for a much shorter period, it's got an annualised return 11.5% um, since 2014. And for the phase one, or sorry, phase two, um, we just had to since 2009, it's 14.5%. Now, the other thing that I thought was sort of quite interesting here is um, that the sale price is an 8% premium to the sort of last published NAV, which is 31st of March 23. And actually, that was audited NAV as well. Um, and I think obviously a lot of people in, in a climate of rising interest rates have been very sort of worried about these NAV figures. And this is something to keep bashing on about, is that a lot of these are actually quite solid. Um, as I say, it's, it's got a sort of fairly decent uplift there. And um, the other thing that they've sort of said is that obviously, you know, now they've got these figures, it's hard it's over portfolio to return. Um, I think getting rid of these assets improves its correlation, apparently. And I'm guessing, you know, these must have been shorter lived than the rest because it's also actually improved its asset life completion of that is expected in fourth quarter of this year um second thing i want to talk about was the sort of gcp infrastructure and gcp asset backed income proposed merger now you may remember we sort of talked about this a few weeks ago um there was also sort of talk of there being merger with rm infrastructure as well to actually create sort of quite a decent sized um, sort of infrastructure debt fund Basically, now well, I think we, last week's show we talked about the fact that you know our infrastructure decided that or the board decided that it wasn't going to work for them, for various reasons. And you can sort of look at our website; that's all explained there. Um, but now, actually, the discussions with Gabby have come to an end as well. Um, and really, what has come out of this is that, uh, as one would hope and expect, there's been a sort of consultation with the balls, with the major shareholders of sort of both funds. And the sort of quote that they're using is there's been a divergence of views or a divergence of views exists regarding the merit of the scheme amongst shareholders of Gabby. Um, and they sort of go on to say that a significant minority of Gabby investors opposed to the deal. Um, this was sort of, I guess, a sort of disappointing or sort of surprise outcome for us. I think the merger had merits for all parties. Um, but I think if you cast your mind back, it wasn't that long ago that Gabby was trying to break off three of its property assets into a sort of separate REIT. And I think overall it's, it's sort of done quite well, but there have been been issues. And I thought you might have actually seen pressure coming the other way, um, possibly sort of GCP infrastructure shareholders saying they're not so keen, but that actually doesn't appear to be what's actually derailed this. Um, I say this was a shame because they were trying to create a larger, more efficient fund, which would have had greater lived liquidity. So we thought it was going to benefit everybody. Um, obviously, as I say, it's going to be focused, focused on infrastructure and real asset debt. Um, I think there's a lot of value there at the moment. So you know, once again, it would have pulled this together and just made you know, a more sensible fund. Um, and you know, this is going to carry on in the future, but they were aiming to you know, crystallise some of that value, return value to shareholders, and actually get the combined fund a re-rating. Now, I think, as I said, it's good to see shareholders being cons consulted and their sort of views being listened to. Um, but obviously, this is the result that we've got now. Both sort of parties have come out and said what they sort of want to do in the future. We just covered GCP infrastructure first. It says that it's continue or committed to accelerating its capital reallocation strategy. So that's going to continue. Um, obviously, debt for a lot of these funds has been an issue. So it's got some available cash. And as it gets 
you know, drawdowns, et cetera, or distributions, it's going to focus on two main things. First thing is to pay down its debt. Um, it's currently got 104 million outstanding. I think that's on an RCF. It's going to get that down as low as it says it possibly can. Um, and also it's, I think where it feels it's more efficient, going to use surplus cash to actually fund share buybacks and try and get um, the sort of discount down that way as well by obviously taking out um, excess supply from the market. It says on that basis, it's not expecting to deploy any new capital soon. Um, the threshold for new investment activity remains high. And I'll sort of go and show you the discount that it's trading at um, in a second. But um, board says it's going to work with the manager to try and accelerate that capital turn process. Um, it's currently trading discount about 35.2%. So you can see why, you know, that's a fair hurdle for your know, new investment to kill, or, you know, clear. And it's offering a yield of about 9.8%. If we just look over, I mean, you can see that NAV, not surprisingly, is still held pretty, pretty solid. Um, but these things have derated in a sort of climate of rising interest rates. But overall, it actually looks pretty solid. Um, if we look at what sort of... Uh, Gabby shareholders have said that sort of consultation while there's a significant minority and they want to proceed with the merger they have said that they want a continuation vote um and the board's responded to this and it's going to introduce one at the 2024 agm and assuming that it passed it says it will do them every four years thereafter in the meantime in a similar way to gcp it's going to use whatever sort of surplus cash it has to get that RCF down, so reduce its debt level, and then buy back shares once again when these are material discount uh, NEV. Now, the sort of nice thing about all of this is that in terms of this merger, um, Gravis were sort of pro and they were prepared to underwrite a, a decent chunk of the costs, albeit they were they were capped. And we're not that far into the process. Um, so both funds have come out and said there will be little or no cost to either them for one engaging in these discussions and actually terminating it at the stage. Um, if you look at Gabby, as I say, it is sort of similar kind of metrics to uh, GCP infrastructure. So fractionally lower discount, 33.9%, but actually marginally higher yield, 10.2%. Um, as I say, if you look at the chart here, you can see once again, pretty solid NAV. And I think you know, this is one of the things I sort of read through from looking at a lot of these sort of types of funds when they are selling assets they are tending to sell them at a premium to nav which is what you know a lot of people have been sort of worried about and i think that underpins that actually there's potentially quite a lot of value there anyway let's have a quick look at hydron capital's results they've had their interim results six months the 30th of june um yeah i think actually as i say this is investing in these sort of early stage hydrogen companies but you can see a decent bit of progress there and i thought you know it's worth having a quick chat about so Nav increased by 3.4% over the half year to 129.7 million, it's about 130 million quid. Nav per share increased to 100.7p save, and obviously that's now above the issue price. But, you know, reflecting what's going on in markets, um, discount has opened up, share price is actually down 19.7%. And the thing that I found interesting is, you know, obviously this is early stage, but you can see positive progress in these results, quite, you know, significant positive progress. So, and uh, revenue growth from portfolio um, in the 12 month period to June is 52 million pounds, which is 170 percent up versus the prior year. So you can see actually these things are making progress. And the other thing and I really thought this was quite interesting is that H then has looked at obviously what its peers are doing and it estimates the carrying value of its private portfolio is at least 30 percent lower than comparable listed hydrogen companies. Um, and I think you would expect some sort of discount, they call it a discount for marketability, you know, with private assets, because you can't go out and sell them the same way as easy as you can with a listed one. Um, but 30%, I mean, it looks very, very conservative. And once again, if you, you know, if you were to list those assets, theoretically, you know, you could get a sort of decent uplift. So, you know, once again, just a thought. Now, other things that came out of this result, and um, they have been doing some investment activity. It's mostly centered on follow ones. There's been one new investment, um, complete first investment, in private hydrogen project. This is the project in Germany, something we've discussed here. And you can find details of that on the site. And they've made some um, further investments in three existing assets. And that's eight million quid's worth. Um, weighted average discount rate at 30th of June was 13.7%. 
And that, you know, compared to perhaps a lot of alternative asset funds, seems pretty pretty punchy. It's quite quite high. Um, so you can see why there's a lot of you know, potential value in there. Um, and I think obviously that will come down as these things progress and sort of make their way maturity. But there's a, a decent margin of error. Um, obviously, once again, reflecting changes in that the, there was a, some negative influence on the NAV, even though the overall NAV went up because of the other creepy things. Um, the impact was sort of negative 5.1p with discount rates moving, et cetera. But actually, key thing with a lot of this early stage stuff is having access to cash. Um, when you consider it's got about 130 million portfolio, you can see that it's basically got about 12 million of cash and actually listed hydrogen assets, which it should be able to quite readily turn into cash. Um, so, you know, just under 10% of it, which gives them, I think, a sort of reasonable buffer for more follow investment as required. Um, with these results and obviously the growth, they have said that, you know, fundamentally the clean hydrogen sector continue to strengthen, you know, despite the recent macroeconomic conditions and you can see that um share price down 19.7 percent yet yeah, obviously they're getting this revenue growth in the portfolio um there's a lot going on in this space so they reckon they've seen 13 billion of investment in green hydrogen year to date which is a 380 percent increase over 2022 levels now you can see there's obviously been a lot of noise coming out of government about you know perhaps rolling back um on our climate commitments i think a lot of this is going on and there's a huge place for this and particularly and we'll just look at the discount list in a second but yeah um there's a lot to say there's actually quite a positive outlook and despite the noises from government there's actually a sort of supportive regulatory outlook now just remember obviously this is early stage so you're not getting any yield of this but it is 44 and a half percent discount to nav which is illustrated here and i say it has come off a lot um since the middle of the year so you know, something to think about just want to talk very quickly about nippon active value um we've already covered the sort of proposed mergers with aberdeen japan and atlantis japan growth which you know, make a lot of sense to us um a little bit of news this week it had its agm and the shareholders improved a couple of changes um uh, probably the key one is it was on the specialist fund segment which you know private investors, et cetera, can access much easier for professional investors to access, but it's moving to the premium main list. Um, and that's going to make it easier for access to everybody should improve liquidity and, you know, say, make it more accessible. Um, shareholders also approved the revised investment policy. There's no sort of massive changes here, but they're going to have more capital once the other two funds are merged in. And really, they've made some changes just to give them a bit more flexibility to manage that. Um, it's worth saying that the mergers were both contingent on um, Nippon Active Value moving to the premium segment, so which required the shareholder approval. That's now happened. So it looks like full steam ahead. Um, in terms of the other funds, the meetings they required, Aberdeen Japan has got to have two. You're going to see those one next week, 28th of September. Um, so next Thursday. And then both funds have got a meeting on the 10th of October. Um, and then I imagine to say that will proceed as planned. Um, last year, I wanted to talk about was Holland Street. So um, what has happened is they made an announcement this week. They want to shift the fund away from being an investment trust. This could lose or leave the sector. It's going to be a pretty simple transaction if it proceeds as planned. Basically, it's going to be a sort of one for one share swap. You've got um, or shareholders have sort of shares in existing hold co, which is classified as an investment trust. And rather than try and reclassify that, they're just going to swap it into a new structure, which is classified as a sort of yeah, conventional company. Um, they say that this will allow the business to access investment from a wider investment base, which in turn is expected to drive increased liquidity. Um, I mean, ah. Oh, I am a little bit suspect about this because, you know, I think they've really got the right shareholder group now. Um, and if anything, it's probably or has the risk of pushing those investment company investors away. And I don't know that it's necessarily going to attract much more, but obviously, you know, time will tell. Um, but the reason they say that you know, this is appropriate is obviously there are some subtle changes afoot. They say the asset manager is set to play a larger role in dictating Pollen Street's investment activities. Um, which, you know, bearing in mind it manages the portfolio, I'm I'm kind of intrigued to what that that means because um, they don't really fill that out. Um, they also say 
as it has evolved already, already, Pollen Street's business is not as readily compatible with the definition of an investment company and therefore be more appropriate for the new hold coal to trade as a commercial company. Um, as I say, I, mean, I think this could potentially alienate some existing investors. I think people really need to look at what's happening here. This is a little bit sort of reminiscent of what happened with GLI Finance, which I think is now Sankus Lending. But it went through, and you know, even before that, various sort of iterations. But I think during the GLI Finance period, what it was doing became a lot more complex. And so, you know, if this is doing something similar, yeah, maybe, you know, investors need to give that consideration. Because um, I, I do think if this sort of changes, it just could be you know, harder for the market to understand and digest. And there is always the risk you end up with something that is riskier and that's not what you've bought into in the first place. Um, this is the sort of things that they go on to say the scheme will also allow for majority investments in PRA supervised banking institutions in a manner that avoids imposition of consolidated capital requirements at holding company level under the relevant bank capital regulation. I think we're getting to some quite technical stuff here. And this just underlines my point that, you know, for a you know, otherwise potentially quite simple investment company, you know, maybe this is actually just a bit too much. Um, and then just final couple of things, the insertion of a non-UK incorporated hold company Holding company is a practical long term measure which Pond Street undertook to the PRA, the subject to relevant share and regular approvals to implement or to regularize its existing capped investments in PRA supervised banking institutions going forward. Just making my point here, this sounds like this is more than a lot of existing investors might want to be involved with. And this is the thing that sort of worries me. I've just looked back through the RNS, I can't see any details of any consultation. And I feel if they're making these sorts of proposals they should have spoken to people i get a feeling that maybe this suits the manager very well maybe it just doesn't suit shareholders as well but yeah from the announcements it's difficult to see what it actually means and i think yeah, hopefully we'll get a bit more color on that in sort of coming weeks anyway um that's all i wanted to talk about today um as you say just quickly show big old discount here um that's why and significantly this might have precipitated this um but yeah Here's a sort of usual disclaimer. If you've got a moment, just please have a read of that. If you haven't got time now, then you know, sort of please come back and look, because obviously there is important information there. 